A Horse and Two Goats by R. K. Narayan Of the 700 villages dotting the map of India, in which the majority of India's 500 million live, flourish, and die, Kritam was probably the tiniest, indicated on the district survey map by a macroscopic dot, the map being meant more for the revenue official out to collect tax than for the guidance of the motorist who in any case could not hope to reach it, since it sprawled far from the highway at the end of a rough track, furled up by the iron-hooped wheels of bullock carts. But its size did not prevent its giving itself the grandiose name Kritam, which meant in Tamil, coronet, or crown on the brow of the subcontinent. The village consisted of fewer than thirty houses, only one of them built from brick and cement. Painted a brilliant yellow and blue all over with gorgeous carvings of gods and gargoyles on its balustrade, it was known as a big house. The other houses, distributed in four streets, were generally of bamboo thatch, straw, mud, and other unspecified material. Mooney's was the last house in the fourth street, beyond which stretched the fields. In his prosperous days, Mooney had owned a flock of sheep and goats, and sallied forth every morning driving the flock to the highway a couple of miles away. There he would sit on a pedestal of a clay statue of a horse, while his cattle grazed around. He carried a crook at the end of a bamboo pole, and snapped foliage from the avenue trees to feed his flock. He also gathered faggots and dry sticks, bundled them, and carried them gathered for duel at sunset. His wife lit the domestic fire at dawn, boiled water in a mud pot, threw into it a handful of miller flour, added salt, and gave him his first nourishment for the day. When he started out, she would put in his hand a packed lunch, once again the same millet cooked into a little ball, which she could swallow with a raw onion at midday. She was old, but he was older, and needed all the attention she could give him in order to be kept alive. His fortunes had gradually declined, unnoticed. From a flock of forty which he drove into the pen at night, his stock had now come down to two goats, which were not worth the rent of a half rupee a month. The big house charged for the use of the pen in their backyard. And so the two goats were tethered to the trunk of a drumstick tree, which grew in front of his hut, and from which occasionally Mooney could shake down drumsticks. This morning he got six. He carried them in with a sense of triumph. Although no one could say precisely who owned the tree, it was his because he lived in its shadow. She said, If you are content with the drumstick leaves alone, I could boil and salt some of you. Oh, I am tired of eating those leaves. I have a craving to chew the drumstick out of sauce, I tell you. You only have four teeth in your jaw. But your craving is for big things. All right, get the stuff for the sauce, and I will prepare it for you. After all, next year you may not be allowed to ask for anything. But first, give me all the stuff, including the measure of rice or melee, and I will satisfy your unholy craving. Our store is empty today. Da, chili, curry leaves, mustard, coriander, gingerly oil, and one large potato. Go and get this. He repeated the list after her in order not to miss any item and walked off to the shop in the third street. He sat on an upturned packing case below the platform of the shop. The shopman paid no attention to him. When he kept clearing his throat, coughing and sneezing, until the shopman could not stand it any more and demanded, What ails you? You will fly off the seat into the gutter if you sneeze so hard, young man. Mooney laughed inordinately, in order to please the shopman at being called young man. The shopman softened and said, You have enough of the imp inside to keep a second wife busy, but for the fact the old lady is still alive. Mooney laughed appropriately again at this joke, and completely won the shopman over. He liked his sense of humor to be appreciated. Mooney engaged his attention in local gossip for a few minutes, which always ended with a reference to the postman's wife, 
who had eloped to the city some months ago. The shopman felt most pleased to hear the worst of the postman, who had cheated him. Being an internet postman, he returned home to crit time only once in ten days, and every time he managed to slip away again without passing the shop in the third street. By thus humoring the shopman, Mooney could always ask for one or two items of food, promising repayment later. Some days the shopman was in a good mood and gave in, and sometimes he would lose his temper and suddenly bark at Mooney for daring to ask for credit. This was such a day, and Mooney could not progress beyond two items listed as essential components. The shopman was also displaying a remarkable memory for old facts and figures, and took out an oblong ledger to support his observations. Mooney felt impelled to rise and flee, but his self-respect kept him in the seat and made him listen to the worst things about himself. The shopman concluded, If you could find five rupees and a quarter, you will have paid off an ancient debt and then could apply for admission to Swarga. How much have you got now? I will pay you everything on the first of the next month. As always, and whom do you expect to rob by then? Mooney felt caught and mumbled. My daughter has sent word that she will be sending me money. Have you a daughter? Sneered the shopman. And she is sending you money. For what purpose, may I know? Birthday. Fiftieth birthday, said Mooney quietly. Birthday? How old are you? Mooney repeated weakly, not being sure of it himself. Fifty. He always calculated his age from the time of the great famine, when he stood as high as the parapets around the village well. But who could calculate such things accurately nowadays, with so many famines occurring? The shopman felt encouraged when the other customers stood around to watch and comment. Mooney thought helplessly, My poverty is exposed to everybody, but what can I do? Most likely you are seventy, said the shopman. You also forgot that you mentioned a birthday five weeks ago that what, when you wanted castor oil for a holy bath. Bath? Who can dream of a bath when you have to scratch the tank bed for a bowl of water? We would all be parched and dead before the big house, or they let us take a pot of water from their well. After saying this, Mooney unobtrusively rose and moved off. He told his wife, That scoundrel would not give me anything. So go out and sell the drumsticks for what they are worth. He flung himself down into a corner to recoup from the fatigue of his visit to the shop. His wife said, You are getting no sauce today, nor anything else. I can't find anything to give to you to eat. Fast till the evening. It'll do you good. Take the goat and be gone now. She cried and added, Don't come back before the sun is down. He knew that if he obeyed her, she would somehow conjure up some food for him in the evening. Only he must be careful not to argue and irritate her. Her tempo was undependable in the morning, but improved by evening time. She was sure to go out and good work grind corn in the big house, sweep or scrub somewhere, and earn enough to buy foodstuff, and keep a dinner ready for him in the evening. Unleashing the goats from the drum tree, Mooney started out driving them ahead and uttering weird cries from time to time in order to urge them on. He passed through the village with his head bowed in thought. He did not want to look at anyone or be accosted. A couple of cronies laughing in the temple corridor hailing him, but he ignored their call. They had known him in the days of affluence when he lorded over a flock of fleecing sheep, not the miserable gawky goats that he had today. Of course, he also used to have few goats for those who fancied him, but real wealth lay in sheep. They bred fast and people came and bought the fleece in the shearing season. And then that famous butcher from the town came over on the weekly market days bringing him beetle leaves, tobacco, and often enough some bang, which they smoked in a hut in the coconut grove, undisturbed by wives and well-wishers. After a smoke, one felt light and elated and inclined to forgive everyone, including that brother-in-law of his, who had once tried to set fire to his home. But all this seemed like the memories of a previous birth. Some pestilence afflicted his cattle. He could, of course, guess who had lain his animals under a curse. And even the friendly butcher who would not touch one at half the price. 
and now here he was left with the two scraggy creatures. He wished someone would rid him of their company too. The shopman had said that he was seventy. At seventy, one only waited to be summoned by God. When he was dead, what would his wife do? They had lived in each other's company since they were children. He was told on their day of the wedding that he was ten years old when she was eight. During the wedding ceremony, they had to recite their respective ages and names. He had thrashed her only a few times in their career, and later she had the upper hand. Progeny, none. Perhaps a large progeny would have brought him the blessings of the gods. Fertility brought merit. People with fourteen sons were always so prosperous and at peace with the world themselves. He recollected the thrill he had felt when he mentioned the daughters to that shopman. Although they was not believed, what if he did not have a daughter? His cousin in the next village had many daughters, and any one of them was as good as his. He was fond of them all and would buy them sweets if he could afford it. Still, everyone in the village whispered behind their backs that Mooney and his wife were a barren couple. He avoided looking at anyone. They all professed to be up so high, and everyone else in the village had more money than he. I am the poorest fellow in our caste, and no wonder that they spurn me. But I won't look at them either. And so he passed on with his eyes downcast along the edge of the streets, and people left him also very much alone, commenting only to the extent. Ah, there he goes with his two goats. If he slits their throats, he may have more peace of mind. What has he to worry about anyway? They live on nothing, and have nothing to worry about. Thus people commented when he passed through the village. Only on the outskirts did he lift his head and look up. He urged and bullied the goats until they meandered a crawl along to the foots of the horse statue on the edge of the village. He sat on the pedestal for the rest of the day. The advantage of this was that he could watch the highway and see the lorries and buses pass through to the hills, and it gave him a sense of belonging to a larger world. The pedestal of the statue was broad enough for him to move around as the sun traveled up and westward, or he could also crouch under the belly of the horse for shade. The house was nearly life-size, molded out of clay, baked, burnt, and brightly colored, and reared its head proudly, pressing its forelegs in the air and flourishing its tail in a loop. Beside the horse stood a warrior with his scythe-like mustachios, buggling eyes, an aquiline nose. The old image makers believed in indicating a man of strength by bulging out his eyes and sharpening his mustache tips, and also decorated the mud through the ravages of sun and wind and rain when it came. But Muni would insist that he had known the beads to sparkle like the nine gems at one time in his life. The horse itself was said to have been as white as a dobe washed sheet, and had had on its back a cover of pure brocade of red and black lace matching the multicolored sash around the waist of the warrior. But none in the village remembered the splendor as no one noticed its existence. Even Mooney, who had spent all his waking hours at its foot, never bothered to look up. It was untouched even by the young vandals of the village, who gashed tree trunks with knives and tried to topple off milestones and inscribed lewd designs on all walls. This statue had been closer to the population of the village, but when the highway was laid through, or perhaps when the tank and wells dried up completely here, the village moved a couple of miles inland. Mooney sat at the foot of the statue, watching his two goats graze in the arid soil among the cactus and the lantana tree bushes. He looked at the sun. It was tilted westward, no doubt, but it was not the time to go back home. If he went too early, his wife would have no food for him. Also, he must give her time to cool off her temper and feel sympathetic, and then she would scrounge and manage to get some food. He watched the mountain road for a time signal. When the green bus appeared around the bend, he could leave, and his wife would feel pleased that he had let the goats feed long enough. He noticed now a new sort of vehicle coming down at full speed. It looked like both a motor car and a bus. He used to be intrigued by the novelty of such spectacles, but of late work was going on at the source of the river on the mountain, and an assortment of people and traffic went past him, 
and he took it all casually and described to his wife, later in the day, everything he saw. Today, while he observed the yellow vehicle coming down, he was wondering how to describe it later to his wife, when it spluttered and stopped in front of him. A red-faced foreigner, who had been driving it, got down and went around it, stooping, looking, and poking under the vehicle. Then he straightened himself up, looked at the dashboard, stared in Mooney's direction, and approached him. Excuse me, is there a gas station nearby, or do I have to wait until another car comes? He suddenly looked up at the clay horse and cried, Marvelous! without completing his sentence. Mooney felt he should get up and run away, and cursed his age. He could not readily put his limbs into action. Some years ago he could outrun a cheetah, as happened once when he went to the forest to cut fuel, and it was then that two of his sheep were mauled a sign that bad times were coming. Though he tried, he could not easily extricate himself from his seat, and then there was also the problem of the goats. He could not leave them behind. The red-faced man wore khaki clothes, evidently a policeman or a soldier. Mooney said to himself, He will chase or shoot if I start running. Some dogs chase only those who run. O oh, Siva, protect me. I don't know why this man should be after me. Meanwhile, the foreigner cried, Marvelous! Again, nodding his head. He paced around the statue with his eyes fixed on it. Mooney sat frozen for a while and then fidgeted and tried to edge away. Now the other man suddenly pressed his palms together in salute, smiled, and said, Namaste! How do you do? At which Mooney spoke the only English expressions he had learned. Yes, no. Having exhausted his English vocabulary, he started in Tamil. My name is Mooney. These two goats are mine. And no one can gainsay it through our village is full of slanderers these days who will not hesitate to say that what belongs to a man doesn't belong to him. He rolled his eyes and shuddered at the thought of evil-minded and women peopling his village. The foreigner faithfully looked in the direction indicated by Mooney's fingers gazed for a while at the two goats and the rocks, and with a puzzled expression took out his silver cigarette case and lit a cigarette. Suddenly remembering the courtesies of the season, he asked, Do you smoke? Mooney answered, Yes, no. Whereupon the red-faced man took a cigarette and gave it to Mooney, who received it with surprise, having had no offer of a smoke from anyone for years now. These days when he smoked bong were gone with his sheep and the large-hearted butler. Nowadays he was not able to find even matches, let alone bong. His wife went across and borrowed a fire at dawn from a neighbor. He had always wanted to smoke a cigarette. Only once did the shopman give him one on credit, and he remembered how good it had tasted. The other flickered the lights open and offered the light to Mooney. Mooney felt so confused about how to act that he blew on it and put it out. The other, puzzled but undaunted, flourished his lighter, presented it again, and lit Mooney's cigarette. Mooney drew a deep puff and started coughing. It was racking, no doubt, but extremely pleasant. When his cough subsided, he wiped his eyes and took stock of the situation, understating that the other man was not an inquisitor of any kind. Yet, in order to make sure, he remained wary. No need to run away from a man who gave him such a potent smoke. His head was reeling from one of those strong American cigarettes made with roasted tobacco. The man said, I come from New York. Took out a wallet from his hip pocket and presented him his card. Mooney shrank away from the card. Perhaps he was trying to present a warrant and arrest him. Beware of khaki, one part of his mind warned. Take all the cigarettes or bong or whatever is offered, but don't get caught. Beware of khaki. He wished he weren't 70 as the shopman had said. At 70, one didn't run but surrendered to whatever came. He could only ward off trouble by talk. So he went on. All the in the chast tamal for which Kretam was famous. 
Even the worst detractors cannot deny that the famous poetess Avyayar was born in this area, although no one could say whether it was Kratam or Kupan, the adjoining village. Out of this heritage, the Tamil language gushed through Muni in an unimpeded flow. He said, Before God, sir, Bagwan, who sees everything, I tell you, sir, that we know nothing of the case. If the murder was committed, whoever did it will not escape. Bagwan is all-seeing. Don't ask me about it. I know nothing. <laughs>